three o'clock, let's start. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa Bodhang Tamang Sankang Namasami. So, welcome to uh, the next class on the Word of the Buddha. Uh, these, this is a compilation of uh, quotes and passages and even whole suttas from the uh, scriptures of early Buddhism. And uh, they are unique here because it's a new translation and as I have to say every time because there's always some people coming for the first time this translation uh, is based on what I learned from Professor A.K. Warder teaching Pali that you never translate word by word you translate phrase by phrase or sentence by sentence because that's a unit of language when you don't translate word for word, but you take the phrase, find its meaning and give it a translation, then it becomes far more meaningful. Also, I've taken out much of the repetitions. And also, thirdly, um, re-translated some of the key terms. Those key terms, you know, such as mindfulness, uh, such as view, and in here, I've got motivation instead of intention. These are important because they open up different angles of the Dharma which can be hidden from people when the translation is not that accurate. Those translations which you may have heard many, many times were done over a hundred years ago and they tend to stick. But as a Buddhist monk, we're not supposed to be attached to things. If we can see something better, we let go of the old to actually to take the new. And so uh, on these uh, factors of the Eightfold Path, which we are going to go on to number two today, you will find some of the translations of key words are different than what you've heard before. In particular, now we have the second factor of the Eightfold Path, and it's sometimes called right thought, sometimes called right intention and even calling it right thought for someone who's done a lot of meditation and sees that thinking is one of those uh, mental activities which hinder wisdom, which stop you getting um, insight and create much suffering in your life to think that there could be such a thing as right thought that was counterintuitive to me and I started to prefer what's called right intention, but even that was you know, too much you know, planning something for the future. And uh, right motivation was for me the most accurate meaning for this term. Uh, where this actually uh, translation came from was as a Buddhist monk we have our rules of discipline. And some of those rules are like a legal code and you know, they can be very intricate and because when I was a young monk hardly anyone truly understood those rules of conduct for the monastic community I took it on myself to really study deeply what's called the Vinaya and there I came across a concept which is also reflected in Western legal system which is the difference between motivation and intention they're two different things. So motivation is you've, you're looking at an act, an act of body or speech, where did that come from? That's called motivation. What was before that act? What sort of made you do it? Where was it coming from? Usually they say from uh, desire, ill will, jealousy, those are all motivations. And intention is where it's going to. 
what you hope to achieve you know, by that action or by that speech. Intention is where the act is leading to, motivation is where the act is coming from. And once you get that framework uh, in a person's head, it actually opens up the Eightfold Path because we started off with right view, the basic ground of understanding from where your actions of body, speech and mind actually come from. Once you have the correct view, then that makes the motivation where you're coming from very, very clear. So we have right motivation and that is followed right speech, right action, right livelihood. Motivation first and that makes speech, action, livelihood uh, virtuous. If it comes from a wrong motivation, from personal desire, fear, ill will, it's obviously going to turn out to be a wrong speech, action, livelihood. So you get the motivation right, speech, action, livelihood starts to occur. Where's it going to? The, the endeavor, which is a new word for what most people call right effort. Effort, that translation has caused a lot of problems for many, many Buddhists, many meditators especially, putting forth immense effort and just getting more stress and even injuring your own body, let alone uh, your mind. Too much effort. And then, of course, the mindfulness, which is a brilliant translation. And instead of concentration, which is something you do, stillness, which is something which happens, not something you do. Stillness is what occurs when you don't do stuff. So there's new translations here, which is one of the reasons why it opens up new angles on the Buddha's teachings. So we start off here, with, we've uh, spent a couple of, or two or three sessions on right view. Now we get to right motivation. These are standard um, explanations, definitions of right motivation, first of all from the Diga Nikaya. Actions of body, so what now is right motivation? Action of body, speech and mind coming from a motive of renunciation, coming from a motive of kindness and coming from a motive of gentleness. This is called right motivation. This is nekama, which means letting go, renouncing, not trying to accumulate things and get more stuff, but seeing how much you can let go to renounce. Ajahn Chah would often uh, say this again and again and again. If you meditate, you meditate not to get more things, not to attain more things, not to get more certificates which you can hang on your wall, Sotapanna, once returner, fourth jhana achiever. It's not to get things, it's to renounce things, to let them go, to have less. And straight away, that can change a person's practice of Buddhism. We're not here to become great beings. And we're not here to get more attainments and to show off. We're here to actually to disappear, to let go, to renounce stuff. And of course, that also means to renounce the past, renounce the future, renounce as much as you can. That by itself, a newcomer. Usually, they say that you know when a person becomes a monk or a nun, they renounce. But that's just only on the outside. It's renouncing everything here. So, renunciation. The next one is coming from a motive of kindness. When I first looked at the Eightfold Path, I said, where is the compassion? Where is the kindness here? I couldn't see it. And then when you look at right motivation number two, and it fully explained, this is the second factor. In part, it's called Awayapada. Awayapada means the opposite of ill will. But you now, the opposite of ill will, that's just uh, a word by word translation. You look how it's actually used, what it means. It means metta, compa compassion, kindness. This is a motive of kindness. You're coming from kindness. And you're coming also from a motive of gentleness. The gentleness, the word, is uh, very well understood by people these days, thanks to Mahatma Gandhi, Ahimsa. You know, and he made that famous by 
know, not uh, his uh, not being violent, uh, being maybe uncooperative to the government if the government is misbehaving, but not being a violent, not being aggressive. You know, it's ahingsaka um, philosophy, which comes from the second factor of the Eightfold Path. So this is about where are you coming from? From gentleness, from kindness, and from letting go. And that is so important. When you say renunciation, letting go, sometimes I call that making peace. And that's what you see on the t-shirts, making peace, being kind, being gentle. That is a translation of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. That is called right motivation. That's an essential part of the path. It's where you're coming from. And so many people I've seen, they don't make progress in meditation or insight because they're not focusing on this factor. They're not renouncing anything, they're trying to attain more things, to gain more things. It's uh, the, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist monk Chogyam Trungpa, who was uh, very questionable in many areas, but he was a person who coined the word spiritual materialism. Just like people have materialism in the world. Now how big is their house? How flash is their car? How expensive is their clothes? You know, that's materialism. We also have spiritual materialism. How enlightened are you? I'm more enlightened than you are. Na 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 na. Unfortunately, that's very childish, but you see that. So that spiritual materialism is overcome when we renounce, renounce, it's letting go. And the kindness as well. There is no place in Buddhism for masters with sticks going behind you and hitting your back when you get sleepy. There's no place for, for Buddhist monks or nuns shouting at you. It's kindness and it's beautiful gentleness, whatever we do. There is no place for asking you to sit down two hours, three hours, and you're hurting yourself, you're killing us. That's far too aggressive. It's not gentle, it's not a hingsaka. So this is one of the most important factors of the Eightfold Path. There's a motive of renunciation, kindness and gentleness. That is called right motivation. And what are unwholesome motivations? Sometimes you know what a thing is by looking at its opposite. And these are motivation of desire for the world of the five senses. Anything to do with the world of the five senses, anything like that. That is um, the opposite of renunciation. For aversion, I don't like this, I don't want this. And also of cruelty. Now from what do these unwholesome motivations originate? Where do they come from? What's their cause for the unwholesome stuff? They arise from perceptions in this world which cause you know, desire for the world of the five senses. You know, a, a man looks at a beautiful girl and it, uh, if you get the wrong perception then you can have like the lust thinking that's going to create you such happiness. You may have the perception of a Ferrari car and you think, wow, I would like one of those. And that's sort of wrong perceptions. You should, perceptions are always sees only a part of what's out there. You see the attractive part. You see the Ferrari car, you just see the beautiful, sleek model, and you don't ever see the fact that this is Perth and you cannot go over 110 kilometers an hour on the freeway. So it's a waste of time, let alone how much it costs. So, but sometimes people have those perceptions and they are not the full perceptions and so they only perceive what they want to see. An aversion of cruelty. So it comes from wrong perceptions. A word of those unwholesome, this is a very deep point, but I'll put it in here because again mentions jhanas. Where do these unwholesome motivations cease without remainder? They cease in the first jhana, these deep meditations, because in those first jhanas you have no more perception of the world of the five senses. The body is gone, sounds, sights, smells and tastes and even perceptions of those things, thoughts of those things are gone. It's not just the five senses are gone, but even the thoughts, anything to do with it, 
is totally gone. You're in a, a world which is separated from this world in which most people live in, the world of the five senses. So that is why the uh, wrong, unwholesome motivations, they all cease. In that first jhana, they're not to be seen at all. But there is still the wholesome motivation. There is still a little bit of will, motivation left in the first jhana, as I've said to you many times. So where do the wholesome motivations, the motivations of renunciation, kindness and gentleness, where do they originate? They arise from the perceptions of these things. You perceive the importance of letting go of kindness and gentleness. And where do those wholesome motivations cease? With that remainder, they cease in the second jhana. Because in the second jhana there's no motivations at all. Nothing can move you. You are perfectly still. So, I mention this because it just supports what I've been teaching for so many years. That in the first jhana, that you still have some movement, but it's only wholesome, wholesome, and you're letting go. It's very kind, very gentle. In the second jhana, nothing moves at all. It doesn't say too much about right motivation, which is one of the reasons why that people don't understand it, not explained enough. But it's very simple, very clear. Where are you coming from when you meditate? when you give dana, Is it coming from, look at me, I am giving this great dana to the, the nuns monastery. That is not dana, that's not renunciation. That's all about me. It's not renouncing. It's not even kind or gentle. So be care, careful to understand where you're coming from. Is it right motivation or not? Any questions on that before we move on to the right speech? It's a very, very important part of the Eightfold Path. It's incredibly important when you meditate. If you get right motivation wrong, you're going to waste a lot of time meditating. Get it correct. Kindness, gentleness, letting go. Not trying to attain something or get somewhere. Being here, being kind, being gentle to yourself, being gentle to your mind. So how many times I've said that look at your mind like a best friend, never as a slave to train and tell what to do. So many people do that. I'm going to train my mind. I'm going to stop it wandering off. If it wanders off a little bit, I'm going to beat it to a pulp. I'm going to meditate and kick ass. I'm going to... That is so un-Buddhist, but people still do that. Anyway. happening in our brain before we actually say or do anything. Ah, okay, yes. That is uh, Professor Libet, 0.6 of a second. What you think to be is your will, your choice, by the time you're aware of what you assume to be choice. It's already happening. So we're but, in charge. But, the great buts, I like, well, actually I don't like buts. But, in this case, I love this but. Uh, he found that, that you can't stop these things. It's, he called it, in a nice use of language, we don't have free will, but we do have free won't. <laughs> I will not do it. So, you can, you can, once that thing is started, you think it's choice. You can't stop. It's a very interesting little piece of psychology. Because we always talk about free will, but what's the opposite of free will? Free won't. In other words, we decide to say no, to stop, to renounce. That is the essence of the sixth factor of the Eightfold Part, the right endeavor sometimes called right effort. But it's not, effort means you're doing something. We don't really have much words to say the effort to renounce or the effort to say no, which is no effort at all. 
So it was a very beautiful play on words by Professor Libet. That's L-I-B-E-T, if anyone wants to check him up on the internet. We don't have free will, but we do have free won't. You can say, I won't. Stop. Thank you for asking that question, it's fascinating. Okay, so now, once one's motivation is in the right place, the other things usually just come together pretty easily, speech, action, and livelihood. But because so many problems start with the mouth, it's not the pen is mightier than the sword, the mouth is more powerful than either of those two. It gets you into so much trouble, it's got me into much trouble, and it will continue to if we don't be careful with our speech. So what now is right speech? Right speech is refraining, again, the won'ts. Refraining from lying, from refraining from malicious gossip, gossip, refraining from harsh speech, and refraining from useless chatter. This is standard definition, now it's explained what actually is lying. And please don't assume that you know, because it's the reason we think we know, that's why we keep making mistakes. So, straight away, this is a standard explanation, you abandon lying and abstain from false speech. This is as it was said in the, the suttas. If you are summoned to a court and questioned as a witness thus, so tell what you know, then not knowing you say I don't know, or knowing you say I do know, not seeing you say I do not see, or seeing you say I do see, thus you do not consciously speak falsehood for your own ends, or for another ends, or for some trifling worldly end. So, and to be a deliberate lie, that's just you know, quite obvious over there, but it just makes it important that why people lie is because it's for your own end or someone else's end or for some trifle, trifling worldly end. There is a purpose to lying. Why do you lie? And uh, because humor is a wonderful teaching method, there was this joke which I heard a long time ago, which is not just funny, but it also shows why people lie. It was a person on trial, and uh, he was accused of a very, very bad crime which carried the death penalty. If he was found guilty, he would be executed. And so during his testimony, the judge interrupted him because the judge thought he was lying. And he asked the person, don't you realize, sir, that lying in a court of law is punished by, you know, quite severely? And the defendant said, yes, I know the penalty for lying in court, and it's much less than for telling the truth. <laughs> if he told the truth, he'd be executed. <laughs> And that's a little joke which you can remember, but that explains why people lie. Because it's not in your interest to tell the truth. For how many politicians is it in their interest to tell the truth? If they did, as they say in Australia, fess up and say what really happened, they would get kicked out of office, they won't be elected the next time. How many times does a wife lie to her husband or a husband to the wife? Because if they told the truth, my husband would kill me. <laughs> Maybe not kill you, but you'd be in big trouble. Same as why kids lie to parents. Why we lie to our boss. Why the boss lies to us. Because it's not in person's benefit to tell the truth. That is a big problem, which is why it's great when we have amnesty, when we understand that people do make mistakes, we can forgive them, so we don't need to lie about them. So it's because of these ends. It's just we're getting into big trouble if we told the truth. That is the problem. But to be a deliberate lie, this is especially for your precepts, to be a deliberate lie, you must be aware I am going to speak falsely before you, 
uh, say that speech. While speaking, aware I am telling a lie, and afterwards be aware I have misrepresented the truth. So, if example, if you speak hurriedly, and you know you mean to say, oh, it's no, it's uh, three twenty-five, and by mistake, I, you know, it's four thirty, because I don't look at the clock properly, then of course that is not a lie. You never beforehand thought I am going to speak falsely. Or if it is telling a joke, that is not a lie. You don't intend to deceive somebody. It's a totally different, as they say, ball game. And so you have to know before, during and afterwards, I'm going to speak falsely, I'm telling a lie, and you know you've misrepresented the truth afterwards. So it has to be you know, really intentional, deliberate. And it is, that's for Vinaya Parajika for his uh, monks' rules. And also, for the monks' rules, it doesn't say this is part of lying uh, for the lay community, but it's very important, and I would like people to practice it, is that if you make a promise, and deliberately realize as you're making the promise, I'm not going to do this, then that is like lying, it's misrepresenting the truth. If I promise you know, to, to go to your house for a dana, you ask me, Nim, can you please come to my house? I want to feed you, it's an important day for me. Like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll go. And I have no intention of going. Making a promise which you don't intend to keep is lying for a Buddhist monk. That's why I don't accept invitations lightly. If you invite me, if I promise to do something, then I have to do it. It's compelling. If it happens that I, just, I can't just do it, I get sick or you know, that uh, something happens which prevents me, then of course it's not breaking uh, my, my promise. I tried to do it but it just didn't work out. I was situations beyond my control. But that is why it's wonderful if people make promises, not carelessly, knowing that to break that promise you know, is bad karma, it is a type of lying, which means that when people do promise to do something for you, you can trust they'll do it. What a beautiful world that will be. They're going to be there to pick you up at a certain time. You know, they're going to be there unless something very, very difficult happens. What a wonderful world that would be. That's why it's called virtue. It leads to happiness. So that is about lying, misrepresenting the truth. Now the next one, malicious... Oh, you've got a question there, yes. Yeah? I've always been impressed with, I think you taught us years ago, is that you allow you can't allow a person to get, get off the track or falsely understand what's true? Ah, and, yeah, uh, that's another that's aspect. Very subtle, very yeah. subtle, but it, it happens all the time. Indeed, because sometimes the you don't intend to misrepresent the truth, but somebody understands it the wrong way. Or and they get the wrong end of the stick, as they say. And this actually came from one of Ajahn Chah's stories. Uh, he said that when he was a young monk, there was a story going around of one of the teachers. And the teacher you know, was asked a question from his disciple and gave the answer and the, the disciple went up on top of the mountain to, to meditate. And just a few hours later, the teacher climbed all the way up to the top of the mountain a long way and said, oh, I gave you the wrong advice. I'm sorry, it was a mistake. And he said he wouldn't wait until the following morning. It was a night time. He had to go up and correct his fault because to deceive or rather misrepresent something to his disciple he said that was like lying to them. 
So it is true that you know, if you have, you know, without any intention, misrepresented the truth and someone's got the wrong end of the stick as they say, then you do have a responsibility, if it's possible, to go to them and actually uh, uh, straighten out what you really meant to say or straighten out their understanding. So they do keep on the right path. It happens all the time. You know, especially I'm sure that you and Barbara, you've misunderstood each other so many times. And instead of just waiting for it to fester and fester and get into big trouble, it's nice to say, well, look, that's not what I really meant. You know, you misunderstood what I meant. It happens so often. So that's a very good point, thank you. Yes? How about lying but without bad intention, you know? Mm. As for example, like someone invites you to their party and then you don't feel like going, you know? Instead of saying, oh, I don't feel like going to your party, you say, oh, I can't go because I've got other commitments. It's a lying. Yeah, sometimes it can be a lie, but there's other skillful means. So, you know, you say, well, you know, I'll consider, I'll get back to you. Or somebody once told me about, um, I think it was in Holland, uh, during the occupation and Second World War, and there's an incredibly moral man who would never lie, and he was also very, obviously, very kind, compassionate. In his house, like in many houses, he was hiding a Jewish family, who if were caught, would be sent to the concentration camps, gassed and killed. So he was hiding, just like the story of Anne Frank. He was hiding these people in his house, and of course the uh, security forces, I think they're called the Gestapo, knocked on his house as they were knocking on everybody's houses and say, have you got any Jewish people in here? If he told the truth, then he would be probably killed and so would the people in his house. But he could not tell a lie. And so you know what he said in his biography, he said, come inside, look for yourself. And they said, thank you, sir, and they left. He had such a great sort of strength and moral character and his openness was such that he got away with it without lying. So it's interesting just how far a person can go and just sometimes you don't need to lie even in those sticky situations. Because what happens if you do make a lie like that, it just becomes something which gets easier and easier you cross the line and it gets easier and easier to tell lies. White lies get more and more grey with time until they go black. They don't stay white. You tell a lie, you can justify it, but it gets worse and worse. That's why there are no exceptions here, you know, for um, false speech. You know, sometimes you look through it, so there must be an exception somewhere, but there ain't. Why? So anyway, the next one is abstaining from malicious gossip. And of course, this can be even worse. You abandon malicious gossip and abstain from talk that causes division. Having heard something, you don't repeat it in order to divide people from one another. You don't sort of say, have you heard what those Christians are up to? Have you heard, you know, what those people on the other temple next door are doing? You know, trying to divide people. Uh, instead, you are one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of unity who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. So. Most of that malicious gossip is divide people, the us and them. <laughs> and gossip is perhaps one of the worst of the speeches. In fact, they always say that gossip is probably of those five precepts which a lay person has to keep, that's probably the worst to break, malicious gossip. And if you don't understand that, I can't resist telling this story of the four priests who had a conference 
and over lunch, they were sitting together, having their lunch together, and one said to the other, this morning we were talking about confession, how important it is that we share everything, even if we made a mistake, that we bring it up and tell our friends. And so he said, I have a confession to make. I know it's very difficult to say this, but uh, every Monday is our day off. Any wine left after the confession, I drink it. And I also go to the bottle shop and take as much liquor as I possibly can. He said, I'm an alcoholic, said the priest. And the other priest said, well, you've been hiding it so well, we never suspected that. It's a terrible thing to do for someone who's a moral leader to be an alcoholic. Never mind, you've confessed, maybe we can help you. And then the other one, next one, sort of said, well, it's a bit hard, but seeing as how you confess to be an alcoholic, he said, I'm a gambler. He said, I'm addicted to gambling. Sometimes I take some money out of the donation box. You know, I, I intend to pay it back, and I bet on anything, on horse racing, you know, on uh, TV gambling. I'm an addicted gambler, and I have big debts, he said. And the other two, three pieces, that's a terrible thing for someone in your position, you know, to be stealing and gambling. And they looked at the third person and said, well, what's your, your thing you'd like to confess? And he said, I don't really want to tell you, but they had to force it out of him. He said, it's adultery. There's one of the women who comes to his church. They've been having an affair. She's married. Said, That's terrible. But you should do a thing like that, but it's wonderful. Isn't it wonderful you can actually confess to your friends? They asked the fourth priest, so what's your worst sin? And he said, look, don't ask me, don't go there. He said, no, no, surely you can tell us. We've told you that you know, alcoholism, you know, gambling, adultery, surely it can't be worse than that. He said, yeah, it is, it's much worse. What is it? He said, well, look, whatever I hear, I have to tell all my friends. I'm a gossip. <laughs> <laughs> so of all of those four things, being a gossip is the worst. So please abstain from malicious gossip. From harsh speech. Having abandoned harsh speech, you should abstain from harsh speech. You speak words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable. Words that go to the heart are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. We don't go around scolding people or shouting at people. I said this in a talk a few days ago. When people are having a relationship together, when they are very close together, they whisper. I love you, darling, you're very lovely, thank you so much. Because they only need to whisper when they're close together. But then there comes a time in relationships when you shout at each other. Why are you shouting? Because you're distant from one another. <laughs> it's a very nice perception. Yeah, you may be actually standing right next to them, but psychologically, emotionally, you've become distant, which is why you need to shout. So, we don't have shouting, harsh speech. We don't call a people a pig, fat so. <laughs> or it maybe it's because I haven't been around such a long time in pubs and in football fields and in what people call the real world. When I'm trying to get some examples of uh, unpleasant speech, harsh speech, you sometimes have to go back a long time to remember things like that. But you know what it's like when people use harsh speech? It's harsh because it hurts, it's really uncouth. So we don't use harsh speech. Gentle, pleasing to the ear. Lovable words that go to the heart are courteous, desired by many, and agreeable to many. Now for those of you objecting, but what happens if somebody does something wrong? That's right, Tenley, coming up soon. 
And this is a famous simile of the saw told by the Buddha. And this just really, really, when I first read this, as I often say, it really hit me hard. Even if terrorists, again, I've changed the translation to terrorists now instead of uh, a gang of thieves. If terrorists were to torture you, such as by savagely cutting off your limbs with a two-handled saw, actually, I think the last time I told this, I said with a serrated kitchen knife, because apparently that's what the Islamic terrorists did to uh, people, cutting off their head with a kitchen knife. Such as savagely cutting off your limbs with a two-handled saw, one who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Instead, you should train yourself thus. My mind will remain unaffected, and I shall speak no bad words. I shall abide compassionate for their welfare, the people torturing you, with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. I shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness, and starting with them, I shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. Thus is how you should train. There's such a hard ask, not one thought of ill will for people who are torturing you. Now it doesn't really matter whether you think that's possible or not. What it does, it sets the bar. The person, your boss at work, your partner, and some friend of yours, your ex-partner maybe. Yes, they may be giving you a hard time, but it's much less and torturing you by cutting off your limbs with a saw. So, if the Buddha asks you to have no feelings of ill will in such extreme situations, surely you can manage no ill will when somebody is just uh, niggling you, giving you bad names, cheating you even. There's far less. So I read this, that if you can remain unaffected, speak no bad words to a torturer, surely you should be able to do that when someone is criticizing you unfairly. It really set the boundaries so that I cannot justify ever having bad speech or having ill will even when other people are really hurting me. It's very powerful. That is how you should train. And apparently there are cases. I remember reading of a Tibetan monk who was um, incarcerated and tortured uh, in, uh, some years ago in China. And he apparently escaped with some of the torture implements and being interviewed. They asked him just how could he endure that? And he said, because I remember these Buddhist teachings. And I remembered that if I had one thought of ill will towards my torturers, they would have won, I would have lost. So even throughout that great pain, I always had a mind of kindness towards those people doing this to me. Hard to do, but that was his challenge, and apparently he succeeded. So it can be done. It means that you know you have actually succeeded. They hurt your body, but they haven't affected your mind. There's still an area which you can control and that gives you your sense of integrity and they don't demean or diminish you anymore. Tough, but when you see it can be done, maybe it can, you can do it too. The very least, just because somebody cuts in front of you on the freeway doesn't mean you have to sort of honk your horn and just utter bad speech. <laughs> so that's not torture. So you have thoughts of goodwill towards them. May you be happy and well. Or like I said uh, some years ago when a burglar came into Bodhinyana Monastery and stole our generator, a couple of chainsaws, and what else did they steal? And I told the monks, hey, you can steal our goods, but don't let them steal your happiness. Don't let them steal your precepts. And anyway, the insurance paid for that and we got some new stuff. We actually made a lot out of that deal. It's really good. 
the burglar is listening, please come back. <laughs> That's only joking. Abstaining from useless chatter. Having abandoned useless chatter, you abstain from unbeneficial talk. I like that translation, unbeneficial talk. You speak at a proper time, speak truth, speak what is beneficial, speak on the Dharma and the discipline. At a proper time, you speak words that are worth recording, reasonable, succinct, and beneficial. Because sometimes people say, Ajahn Brahm, why do you tell jokes? I found a benefit in that, in a way of connecting, especially many of the children, your children, come to Dharma talks. You tell a few funny stories, and they like coming back again. And sometimes you think that that's all they come for, for the jokes, but in the middle, it's amazing the brainwashing which happens, they actually learn <laughs> what's going on. And as a Tibetan monk said so many years ago, he tells jokes because once people's mouths are open, ha ha ha, that's when he can throw in the pill of Dhamma. <laughs> if their mouths are closed, they will never be able to get it in. So, and it's also, I've noticed, like in Bodhinyana Monastery, we have something we call the coffee club, and we always say, oh, we wish no one recorded the speech in that coffee club. But it is beneficial speech, believe it or not, Venerable Sampa, because it does create a sense of bonding, a sense of community, a sense of friendship. <laughs> and it's only just monks letting loose after lunch. So it does create a bond of happiness. And I was really surprised. I always thought the senior monks in Wat Pa Pong, where I grew up, were so serious until I became a senior monk by myself. And then I went to this big ceremony. It was the, uh, the funeral of one of Ajahn Chah's senior disciples. And all the senior monks were in this enclosure. They could not be seen by the lay people. And that's when they started to play around. It was so funny. They're like kids. And these are all the really senior monks. You'd be surprised if you'd gone to visit them. They look so serious. But when you're gone, <laughs> they play around. It's just bonding, human beings. And many of them are really, really highly attained. So beneficial speech has a benefit to it. And also the Buddha said that if you speak too much, it's just like anything like dirt, it has no value. Only small amount of speech, it's like gold, very rare. The right way to criticize people, because those are the four right speeches. To sum up, abstaining from lying, malicious gossip, harsh speech and useless chatter. And the right way to criticize a person, because again, uh, I'm supposed to be a teacher, so if I see someone do something wrong, of course, sometimes you have to point it out to them. But, before you criticize someone, this is you know, from the Buddha's own mouth, his words, before you criticize someone, you should be mindful with respect to five things and carefully establish five things. This also gives another angle to what mindfulness is. It's not just being aware of in the present moment, it's keeping in mind you know, the, the Dhamma, you know, how you should do things. First of all, is my bodily behavior pure? Do I possess bodily behavior that is pure, flawless, and irreproachable? Does this quality exist in me or not? If your bodily behavior is not pure, and you do not possess bodily behavior that is pure, flawless, and irreproachable, there will be those who say of you, please train your own bodily behavior first. The same with speech. Is my behavior of speech pure? Do I possess behavior of speech that is pure, flawless, and irreproachable? Does this quality exist in me or not? If your behavior of speech is not pure, and you do not possess behavior of speech that is pure, flawless, and irreproachable, there will be those who say, if you please train your own speech first. Thirdly, have I established a mind of loving kindness without resentment to my associates? Does this quality exist in me or not? wonderful here, they yeah, include here resentment as being an opposite of loving-kindness. If you have not established a mind of loving-kindness without resentment to your associates, there will be those who say of you, please establish a mind of loving-kindness without resentment to your associates first, before criticizing. Fourth, am I learned? And do I retain and understand what I have learned? 
You may have gone through the courses, but do you remember them? Uh, have I learned much about the teachings that are good in the beginning, in the middle and in the end, which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life, have I retained them in mind, mentally investigated them and understood them properly? Does this quality exist in me or not? If not, there will be those who say of you, please you learn your own tradition first. Basically, make sure you know what you're talking about. This is especially for the monks. Our nuns have both monastic codes been well learned and understood by me. Does this quality exist in you or not? If not, there will be others of you who say, please learn the monastic rules first. They're speaking especially about criticizing a monk or a nun, or monks criticizing each other. Now, do you really know, know the rules, what you're talking about first? You have to know them very well before you criticize other people. Now, number six, you resolve to speak at a proper time, not an improper time. This is so important. If you need to tell your husband, your wife something, you don't go and slam them with it when they've just come home from work, when they're really tired. You, know, you wait for the appropriate moment. Speak at a proper time. And you don't um, criticize people in public. You take them aside. You don't want to embarrass them in front of their friends. So a proper time and place. You resolve to speak truthfully, not falsely. And you resolve to speak gently, not harshly. And you resolve to speak in a beneficial way, not in a way that causes harm. So if that's going to, you know, that time and place is not going to really cause a benefit to anybody, I often do this, the monks, if they're not behaving properly, I see what's going on. But I realize that sometimes they need to learn that for themselves. If I just tell them, do this, do that, sometimes it's not as effective as waiting for them to see the results of bad behavior or bad speech, and then learning from themselves. So sometimes speaking in a beneficial way is actually keeping quiet, not in a way that causes harm. And most importantly, it's repeated again, you resolve to speak with the mind of loving kindness, not harboring ill will. And people can actually pick that up so well. When someone criticizes you, and they really have your well-being in mind, and they are kind and compassionate, then it's so easy to accept. When Ajahn Chah would feel criticize me, you know, you realize he had your best wishes, your, be your, your best, uh, and he had the best wishes and he had your uh, benefit for your own, my practice in mind, so I could accept that. I said, oh yeah, thank you so much for pointing that out. And it was never ever sort of uh, felt like criticism because it was never coming from ill will. So these are the ways we criticize people. In brief, these are the ten things we should consider first of all. Now, is uh, your Behavior, body, speech, good. First of all, you know, are you not being a hypocrite? And are you really coming from loving kindness? And do you know what you're talking about? And is it the proper time? You know, you know are you really speaking truthfully? You're not getting the wrong end of the stick again? And uh, gently, not harshly. Beneficial, not causing harm and again reinforcing with kindness, coming from kindness. Sometimes people think that people won't listen unless you shout at them, but actually they hear you, but they don't respect you. But if you speak with kindness, I found in my life as a teacher, more people would actually follow your advice when it comes from kindness. They respect the advice and they take it with much more weight so that is how to criticize somebody. Any questions on that? Okay, you can see why this is you know, part of the Eightfold Path. Because sometimes that if you have uh, practiced wrong speech, or just the, uh, what happens afterwards, you create so many problems which means your mind does never feel free when it gets time to meditate. It's just keep remembering all these terrible conflicts which we have. And they just, uh, just agitate the mind so much you can never find peace. So if you get your speech correct, 
Ah, it's so easy to have a free, happy life, which gives you the space to be able to pursue mental cultivation. You're all busy enough, we always do enough, so we want to simplify our life. Less things which we need to do. And right speech is a very, very wonderful thing. Uh, the next uh, part of the uh, Eightfold Path, right action. This is what we do. It doesn't go into great detail here, but when you understand it's coming from right motivation of renunciation, kindness and gentleness, you can understand what right action is, what wrong action is. Things like from the destruction of life, refraining from taking what is not given, stealing, refraining from sexual misconduct. And of course sexual misconduct is like breaking the trust of your partner by having another partner. Here, having abandoned the destruction of life, you abstain from the destruction of life. With the rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious and kindly, you dwell compassionate to all living beings. Having abandoned the taking of what's not given, you abstain from taking what is not given. You do not steal the wealth and property of others in the village or in the forest. Having abandoned sexual misconduct, you abstain from sexual misconduct. You do not have sexual relations with those under the age of consent, paedophilia, with those who are unable to give consent, e.g. Uh, e being mentally disabled, who are not free to refuse consent, such as a student to their teacher, where such conduct would be breaking a law or even with one already engaged. And the things in bracket there are just the EGs, so some of the examples which I have added in there, uh, which just shows that you know, when you have a priest or even a monk who um, has sexual relations with their student, you know, let alone being against the law of many lands, it is also against the Eightfold Path as well. And sexual misconduct includes uh, abuse, rape, and uh, other sort of uh, forceful uh, relationships when the other person is either physically, emotionally, or because of their relationship with you as a student and teacher, a boss and worker, unable really, they have some compulsion, so they can't really refuse their consent. So that is the uh, the wrong actions there. Not very much explanation, but I hopefully that you can get the gist of it, because there's so many actions we can do in this life, which aren't specifically mentioned here, but if it does come from the motivation of uh, sensual desire, instead of renunciation, from cruelty, or uh, from um, uh, ill will, then of course it's very likely to fall into the wrong action. If it's coming from renunciation, from kindness, gentleness, it's very hard to actually to, to, to break uh, this, pre this um, part of the Eightfold Path. Right action follows seamlessly. I've often said to monks and also to lay people that the rules and precepts which we keep are not an imposition on us. Once we train our mind to have things like right view and right, in, right motivation, these precepts and monks will become almost automatic. There's hardly any way you can break them. You don't have to keep forcing yourself or controlling yourself. If you come from the right place, from letting go, not trying to attain or, or get stuff, from kindness and gentleness, the precepts flow f seamlessly, automatically, with a great deal of ease. So you don't need to always be on top of yourself, oh, am I breaking this precept, am I breaking that precept? It becomes automatic. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay, we go on to the right livelihood, which is also hardly anything said here, but let's see what we have. What now is right livelihood? And sometimes it's a bit sort of um, 
uh, difficult when you're trying to find out what right livelihood is, when you find the definition here. Here the noble disciple, having given up wrong livelihood, keeps himself by right livelihood. So it doesn't really add much, or does it? Or is the Buddha really saying there that you know, right livelihood and wrong livelihood should be really quite easy to understand? In particular, a lay follower should not engage in his five trades. What five? Trading in weapons, an arms dealer, trading in living beings. That's, you know, the, apparently it's just amazing that even these days that there is still like slavery and um, the sex trade apparently that people buy and sell people. It's still happening. Trading in meat, trading in intoxicants and trading in poisons. A lay follower should not engage in these five trades. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes ask, well what if you, you know, work in the deli? You know, this is like a convenience store. And there's, you know, a little section there with beer. So is that really wrong livelihood? And sometimes uh, it's a difficult one to ask. It's much better if you can possibly work in a place which didn't sell alcohol. But, you know, it's, you're not working in there just to sell alcohol. That's not the main purpose. It's just a small part of the trade. So at least don't work in a bottle shop or a pub. So it's very difficult sometimes. What is right livelihood? What is wrong livelihood? And in the end you ask yourself, you know, how much harm is it giving to other people? Is it harming? Are other beings harming or helping? We used to say that one of the trades over here uh, was actually being a, a, a prison officer. There's many Buddhists who actually work in the, the prisons and because I've been to the many prisons and many other monks have been to the prisons in Western Australia, they're very, very kind people who are really trying to do the best for the, the people they work with. But in the time of the Buddha, if you were a prison officer, you'd always be flogging a person if that was a sentence or executing them. And of course that is you know, really a bad trait, causing such harm upon a person. So sometimes when you look at what the Buddha was saying 2500 years ago, some of the trades like a prison officer then, a prison officer today, you know, it's sometimes a different uh, profession. Uh, and then we have, like, being, yeah, say, go on. Better, better ask me now, chance. Yeah, go so, on. So, there's obviously one of the Jataka, that the Buddha in one of his past life, he made the wheel, right, for the chariot. Yeah. So the, the, the king sort of commission him to make the wheel for the chariot and he yeah. did a very good job. So is, is that okay or not okay? Yeah, a wheel for a chariot because the chariots are used in the army to go to war. So is that a good... Exactly, yeah. So is, is that right livelihood or wrong livelihood? So it's the wheels are also used for cars to get around in. It's not just to go to war, it's to go from A to B. So, it's one of those ethical questions, is that why are you making it for? What's the purpose? And I often quote uh, an anecdote when I was visiting UK several years ago. I was actually picked up from Heathrow Airport by a Sri Lankan Buddhist who was appointed to be the chaplain, the Buddhist chaplain to the British Armed Forces. He was a very good Buddhist and he told me that he was, uh, they were about to have a weekend seminar for every Buddhist in the British Armed Forces and uh, would I like to come and, and give a presentation? And so I did that not so much to serve people, I wanted to find out how can you be a Buddhist serving in the British Army? And the Australian army is maybe okay because they don't go to war. The British are involved in so many conflicts all over the place. So much so that whenever I saw these big pieces of land called Ministry of Defence, I said, that's really a misnomer. It's not the Ministry of Defence, it's the Ministry of Attack. <laughs> but nevertheless, I saw these people, they changed my mind. I always thought when I first went to that seminar, it would be people who were serving, you know, like, uh, 
uh, teaching or the cooks or the dentists for the British Army. And I was surprised they were frontline soldiers. You know, men and one woman as well. And you know, I was wanted to find out how can you be a soldier fighting, I think, in Iraq at the time and be a Buddhist at the same time? So I learned. And one of the things I found there, sometimes if you go into a meeting with people already understanding what's true and what's not true, you miss so much wisdom. I thought, first of all, how can that be? How can you be a good Buddhist and go into war with a gun? firing at people. But they gave this explanation, they uh, were telling me that they felt, they, they actually they, when they first became in the army, they weren't Buddhist. But when they were in the army, that uh, they realized this was really, really important business. They saw life and death. Spirituality or religion became very important for them. And they chose Buddhism once they were in the army because they thought that that would be the best way to deal with the trauma and also to make sure they said that the only time they would ever pull that trigger would be never out of ill will, never out of anger, only out of protection. However they managed to justify that protection. In the end I came, along, came away thinking well, I'm not quite sure if I'm totally convinced, but I'd much rather have Buddhists in an army than any other people. <laughs> They'd pull the trigger much less. And they wouldn't sort of do it out of anger. They'd be far more aware of their emotions and be able to restrain them much more and cause much more havoc. Cause much less havoc, sorry. It's a very, very interesting area. Do you need armies in this world? If you do need armies in this world, what type of people would you like to have in an army? It's an interesting moral question, which means that right livelihood is not something which is black and white. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Buddha said so little about it. Using other considerations to answer that question, whether it's right livelihood or wrong livelihood. And the last little anecdote, there was one of Ajahn Chah's uh, strong supporters and he wanted to keep the five precepts but he said, look, I have to kill fish to feed my family. Subsistence farming in the northeast of Thailand. And he said, if I didn't kill fish, I couldn't feed anybody. And Ajahn Chah told him, he said, well, you know, right livelihood. You know, you shouldn't kill fish, but in your circumstances, he said, kill fish, but only enough to feed your wife and your children. Don't catch fish, you know, to sell in the market for the time being. And in the meantime, Ajahn Chah taught this man everything he knew about herbal medicines. Because in those days, monks, one of the things they had to learn was actually all the plants in the forest and what they could do and how you could heal yourself because there were no doctors available. So if you got bitten by a snake or if you had a wound and it got infected, if you had a fever from malaria or whatever else was in the forest, you know, no way of getting to a doctor. You used your knowledge of herbs, plants to heal yourself. So in those days, those monks, they were just so knowledgeable about herbal medicine. Ajahn Chah was one of them. So he told this, this lay person everything he knew about herbal medicine to the point where this man never needed to catch fish anymore. He had a profession, he had a livelihood of being a herbal medicine doctor. Still really, really poor, but enough. He never needed to catch fish again. There was a guy called Paul Um. Yes. Uh, wait for the microphone to come. Ajahn Brahm, if one is a practicing Buddhist, you know, like for example, five precepts, okay, yeah. So we have gu guidelines in it. So 
it's a many, but I would say we also have to use in certain situations we have to use our inner wisdom you know to judge things too you know I find that um, well, say for example like yeah, say sorry you 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 abide by guidelines okay yeah so if you cross that certain line you know, there's a reaction you know, to tell you you see what I mean. Yeah, sometimes it's like a guiding, you know, oh, something will happen, you see, oh, I've done something wrong. Then you, you sometimes correct yourself it's again. a reaction of remorse. You think, oh my goodness, I've really done something wrong. Sometimes it's a reaction of karma, which things happen to you, but that's much harder to associate, you know, some misfortune with a particular deed. And sometimes it's wrongly attributed, you know, to some bad karma. But uh, it is true that you have to use wisdom. But how can you use wisdom on these things? Many people justify the most terrible crimes and they think they're being wise. So I'd always go back for right livelihood, right action and right speech. Have a look at your right motivation. Mm. Yeah. Because in the law of karma, what every action, speech, body is karma but whether it's good karma, beneficial karma, or bad karma, depends solely on the motivation, mm. not on the act. Mm -hmm. If it's an act, it's karma. What makes it uh, good or bad, or in between, mm. is your motivation. So if the motivation is pure, then usually the action and the speech, the livelihood are pure. Well, what I mean is, John, like if you are practicing Buddhist, if you cross that border, you know, there's the reaction back, you know, to guide you, you know, that so you've done it, you've overdone it, you know, Eddie, this thing, and then sometimes yeah. it is, but sometimes, as any psychologist knows, we can go into denial, we can go into just the most amazing justifications of why it was important to do that crime. So many mass murderers. So they do this because they wanted to clean up Northbridge. They want to get rid of the bad guys. They want to get rid of the, the, the big cause of trouble in this world. You can justify things very, you know, with, with denial. But that's why, go back to the right motivation. Where are you coming from? It's not what you, did you do, but where was that coming from? And if it really is coming from a letting go, from renunciation, not out of personal gain, not what I want, not fame, not power, but really letting go, and from kindness and gentleness, it's very hard to see how a person can actually break any precept. So that is how you judge sort of whether it's worth doing or not. What is your motivation? Where are you coming from? Any other questions? Is there any questions from overseas? Because uh, it finishes on a nice point here, because the right endeavor, six, because I have uh, changed the, the uh, usual translation from right effort to right endeavor, and this is a very important part of the Eightfold Path, I'm going to spend a whole session on this in a few weeks' time. So let's see what we have from overseas. <coughs> Here we go. From USA, <coughs> Japan and Hawaii. <coughs> How do I work on renouncing my past and letting go when people close to me like my fam family remind me constantly of my past mistakes? <laughs> okay, we have to get them to be brainwashed by Buddhist monks so they can let go as well. So you're reminded constantly of past mistakes, but take away, remind me constantly of my past mistakes. Let, if once you let go of those mistakes, they're no longer mine. Don't own them. Don't possess those past mistakes. Say, so, look, I let them go a long time ago. I've learned from them. Just like people again who go to jail, they've done their time. So, when they walk out of jail, why are you reminding them what they've done? They've done the penance, let it go. 
So if you can, in your head, don't associate those past mistakes with me. There was a person a long time ago who did those things. They've grown, they've gone past that stage of their life and that stupidity. So don't ever call them my past mistakes. Why do we own these things? You've heard before that as a Buddhist, when you get wise, you say, not me, not mine, not a self. Renouncing means you don't own things. Yeah, there were mistakes, but not my mistakes. Don't own them. From Japan, does nekama, which is renunciation, occur when acting selflessly? If it really is selflessness, maybe it is. But sometimes people can have a competition. Who is the most selfless? I am more selfless than you are. And then it doesn't become renunciation anymore, but spiritual materialism. Who is the most enlightened? So, it can happen when acting selflessly, but not all the time. In Hawaii, is it better to, to lie to avoid hurting someone's feelings, or should we tell the truth also, or, always, like if someone asks if they are fat? <laughs> so I don't know who you're referring to there, but... <laughs> <laughs> is sometimes uh, there is a polite speech but like it's kind speech which goes to the heart so first of all if you want to someone asks if they are fat right time and right place you say I'll get back to you on that <laughs> so a time when they're feeling much better <laughs> or, uh, depends who people are. Like sometimes, uh, why is that? We always say that sometimes that there's so much stigma in this world. If somebody is, say, uh, has some mental disability, we would never criticize them for having a mental uh, disability. We won't stigmatize them, because it happens to people. We don't stigmatize people in if they're old. So why do we stigmatize people because maybe they're fat or because they've got too much long hair? Fat people's rights. I always remember this fellow who's wearing a t-shirt, someone sent to me on the internet. They were a very, very large person. But on their t-shirt they explained why. And it said, I beat anorexia. <laughs> <laughs> <the t -shirt. laughs> so why would you ask ask if they're fat? If they would said that to me, I said, well, what's wrong with being fat? Take away the stigma. So you can actually use a question like that and get some sort of wisdom coming up. Because some people just they are fat and there's nothing wrong with them, it's not their fault. Why do we blame people? Say you should take better care of your health. And some people, it's some other condition why they're fat. And of course, you know me, it's, it's your fault. You keep bringing me food and you keep saying, you must eat my food. <laughs> There's other reasons. But uh, please never stigmatize people because of personal appearance or because of their, uh, any mental illness or even physical illness. You always say when you look at a person, you go to see them in hospital, please don't see their illness, see the person. Otherwise, again, it's stigmatizing them, only looking at a person because of one, what you perceive to be a defect in them. But the answer is, there are no such things as defects. The crooked trees in the forest all belong. The fat trees in the forest belong, the thin trees in the forest belong, the old trees in the forest belong, the twisted trees in the forest belong. They all belong. So don't stigmatize people. And then, if someone asks if they're fat, just look in the mirror, find out for yourself. That's even somebody asked me that, and where was it when I was in, 
Uh, Hong Kong, second time people have asked me on a retreat, on the question, say, what do monks wear under their robes? And the answer is, you don't hurt somebody's feelings by giving them answers. Say, in Buddhism we have this saying, discover it for yourself. Pachatang Vidyatabha when you he. To be <laughs> to be seen every wise person for themselves. So if you want to understand the answer to that question, ordain as a monk or a nun, then you find out. <laughs> so when people try and upset you with stupid speech, they try and uh, say such things. Oh, it's always wonderful, wonderful ways you can actually answer questions. Okay, so is there any other questions from the floor here? Okay, so we can finish off for today. And uh, my car's coming in 10 minutes to take me back to monastery. And so hopefully you enjoyed uh, this session. It is recorded. I think it does go on the internet somewhere. Well, it goes out anyway. And so the next uh, Sutta class will be on some really heavy stuff, the right endeavor. And after that will be the mindfulness and the stillness. Very good. Hope you enjoyed the new translations. And now we can go and pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha.